Thank you. Part two, or whatever this will be on the internet. Um, the best time to write is? Now! The best place to write is? Here! The best person to write is? Here! Thank you very much. Uh, before we get to our next performer, I wanted to let you all know about um, a little changes for uh, the Grand Tournament number seven next year. I don't know the number for the last Saturday, but actually that's going to be kind of irrelevant because we're going to try to make it a two-day affair. So that's the first change. We're going to try. The reason we're going to do that is we're swapping the format a little bit. So like this year was page and then stage. Well, next year we're going to try to do stage and then page. So here are the basics. The basics are going to be the poets, whoever's going to submit, will send in two poems between 30 and 50 lines on whatever size paper. That'll be determined later. Um, and this will go for storytellers as well. So they're going to send that in, and honestly, judges are going to judge it. But everyone who submits something will get to perform. So let's say we have 50 performers, I'm sorry judges, in, in advance. Um, the judges were going to judge everything, right? But then the performers will pick one of their two poems. They don't get to know the score, the score. So they have to be like, which one is better, which one is better? So then they will perform that one poem, and then we'll take like the top 10 poets from there, or poets, storytellers, musicians. Uh, the musicians are like three, between three and four minutes, something like that. Um, and then the top ten in those categories will then come back and then they'll perform their second poem and then the top five will get chap of top one or top you know what I mean. Top one will get the full length book. But anyway, so just so y'all have that in mind. And then of course previous champions will be allowed to compete as still. Um, except one of them. Uh, but anyway, so that's something to be excited for. And uh, yeah, so let's get back into the story. Yeah. Uh, Rose, you are on deck. Our next performer facilitates workshops, writes short stories, and is currently working on a novel. She is from approximately Cleveland, but like a little bit east of Cleveland, I think. So please welcome Rory Stone Melman. Did I do, because I did that last year. Did I do that this year? No. Okay, all right. Because that, that was all me last year. You hear that? Ask it. Last year. The, the past me did that. Past me did that. Not present me. Well, I'd just like to say before I start that uh, I'm really blown away about everybody we heard tonight. And really excited for the last people. And um, how inspiring. <laughs> Can you guys hear me? Hello? Yeah. How about now? Yes. So this one is titled The Fall. To Sippy. It appeared as if the entire Western United States would soon be consumed by fire. Simultaneous crises converged like a blast of sun through a kid's magnifying glass. Record-busting heat and extensive smoke from the existing burns created an incubator effect that aggravated the 10-year drought. Match-thick forests, nicknamed for the dead standing wood killed off by disease or insect predation were pregnant with flash fuel underbrush thanks to years of misguided wildfire suppression. Changing climate up the ante and August rolled in warlike. Sure, the black-eyed 20-year-old was familiar with her chaparral, lodgepole, giant sequoia which needed fire for maturation and germination. But she believed only active interference could atone for human folly at this point. And God bless the property owners and fire's path and the animals. Despite family hostility, especially on her mother's side, 
Sippy recognized one lone occupation for the modern hero, and she didn't want to marry him. Like the rest of her girlfriends, ditched back in Miles City, raising babies, waiting tables, she wanted to be the best. Are you ready for this, smoke jumper? said the crew boss, calling from the head shed down base. You betcha, Sippy said. That summer was alive in a way that left everything earlier looking something like sleep. There was guard school, wildland firefighter training, parachute practice. Mountain ranges ringed the Hellebase Valley like great lizard spines, and Sippy, wind in lashes as she fell, dropping slowly over hanging gardens, Shoot shadow following like water pooling was alarmed at the inward pressure of altitude, was jealous of those alpine goats and those bighorns perched on walls not for their dexterity. No, she was jealous of them for their inclusion in a herd. And now, in an hour, Sippy, the FNC, or fucking new guy, would jump from the AC, fast drop, leaving the turbulence of slapping rotors, crewmates airborne, finally insignificant, and then, and then the fire. A prime being, a being in prime, is like a lightning strike, said the crew boss during training. And like a cock, it's a big show with nowhere to go, but invincible, when aimed true. Despite the awkward analogy, Sippy felt her particles charged and grounded, ready to converge. Limbs and core, newly exaggerated, were primed like rat trap. Muscle memory made from torn tissue, studying night's determination despite fortitude for lack of Trail crew and mop-up duty, outhouse maintenance, shit slick toilets, missed holidays, isolation, application denials, gut-punching pranks, shame, shame carried for not knowing things that she had no way of knowing. As Sippy was fumbling into her fire gear, lacing her boots, she was suddenly glad for the changes and the challenges. She turned out hard and straight, tough and foul-mouthed, quiet, calculating, rehearsed, professional. Reaching for her packed jump kit on the bed, she saw, beside the cot, conspicuous on the sterile breadth of the bedside table, the unopened pregnancy test. Probably nothing. It wasn't unheard of to skip a period during times of strenuous activity. And all day through training, it was up the mountain, down the mountain, running, parachuting, hauling, digging fire lines, pull-ups, drills, and even a break, she would sit at attention. <coughs> there was the guard school fling. So brief, it hardly counted. Even now, there was no eye color, no last name, a hot shot from a different state. Only the shadow play memories remained. The near stranger's intensity, stubble, cross-shaped scar at the crux of his jaw, bruised lip duels, and black hole couplings. Not so much memories as arousal branded and, in, branded an inch under her skin, which arched with any recall, laying iron eggs into her vulva, belly, sternum, and nipples. Not wanting to seem weak, she hadn't asked for his number. She may have looked for him on social media later, searched for clues she didn't recall, such as raised in no deck, first name Williston, softball coaching, and an evil ex-wife. Nothing, no sign of him, which was fine. 
better even. The pregnancy test ended up in her grocery cart at the Walmart with avocados and duct tape, just a precaution. Sippy, test concealed under her shirt, ran the hallway past the guys to the bathroom, dodging the stampede of goat time. Crewmates grabbing boots, filling water bottles, and spoken tenseness released in door slamming, list checking, swearing, and other sacred deployment routines. Now hunched on the toilet, with arm pinched beneath the seat, she had a tough time peeing and stared at a spot high on the wall, recalling acronyms from the Fireline Handbook. Someone twisted the door handle, pounded a few times. Jesus, what are you doing, your makeup in there? Was the door locked? It was. She let out a breath. The intruder temporarily retreated, and the stream finally came free. Hand unsteady, the stick of plastic was hard to focus on. Such a weightless thing. Somewhere near, the smell of smoke. Spots gathered, hiding floor tiles, the sympathetic nervous system already in hyperarousal from the anticipation of the upcoming mission lit up and the girl broke. She searched her mind for an order, near frantically, from the handbook. One word from the crew boss, even a taunt, would start a landslide of info that she had repeated and repeated, and she would be back in control of herself. She would know what to do next, but nothing came. From nothing, it occurred to her how the sensations of sexual energy and a terror were congruent. The same root, equivalent weight, occupying identical spaces in her anatomy. Yes, oh yes, right there, black, slashed in blue, was an unmistakable, flimsy crucifixion. Banging at the bathroom door, live fire, let's go, get your shit together, rookie, but Sippy was already falling. This was an unrehearsed scenario, deep and void of gravity. There was no recall of leaving the aircraft, no jump spot coordinates, and she cursed in free fall a feeling she didn't have words for. Something about the masochistic chain of command, black and wildlands, androcentric domination utilized for breaking the last American frontier, the last unbroken of America's bodies, that wicked, that feminine fire, forced barren by the fire line. Rookie, it's now or never. This was the crew boss. Okay, I'm coming. Flushed the applicator, suddenly unsure of what made a hero, and moved to go.